Well, a warm welcome to this talk and regular viewers to the channel will be no stranger to Professor Norman Fenton. Norman, welcome. Thank you for coming back. Thanks for having me on again. Great, great to see you. Um, mathematician uh, and, and, and still at the moment, I believe, Professor of Risk Information Management. Um, yeah, I know you're about, I, I know you're about, week, about, to, re yeah. about to retire. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so just a basic question, really, to begin with, Norman, what is risk information management? Well, it's actually a term that we had to make up as a name for the research group, which until a few weeks ago, I ran at Queen Mary. I mean, originally, the group was named Risk Assessment and Decision Analysis, which accurately described my own interest. But we later combined with a different group whose focus was on information retrieval, hence the rename. It's really just a rebranding. But what we mostly had in common was that we used probability, especially a type of probability called Bayesian probability, to improve decision making, especially in critical applications like health, finance and law. Give me a clue on Bayesian probability, Norman. I'm a bit rusty, I'm afraid. So, so Bayesian probability is all about how to properly update beliefs in uncertain events, so things that we don't know for sure whether they did happen, are happening, or are happening in the future. So given it's about how we update our belief in those, given new evidence relevant to those events. So just as an example, maybe relevant to the discussion today, if, if one in a thousand people without COVID symptoms are known to carry the virus, then, then we can assume as a starting probability that there's a one in a thousand chance that I've got the virus if I have no symptoms. So that's based. So that's our so-called prior probability. But suppose we take a piece. Suppose I take a PCR test and it comes back positive. How do I revise? How do I know what the revised so-called posterior probability is given that piece of evidence? Well, it's Bayes that tells us how to revise that probability, taking account of what we know for example, about the accuracy of the test. So it's probability, basically, that's constantly updated every time a new piece of information. Yeah, every time new information comes along. Is, 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 uh, comes along. Yeah, and I'm not going to ask you to do this, but you can prove all this mathematically, presumably. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's, not, it's accepted that Bayes is the correct rational way to revise probabilities in the light of new evidence. Yeah, for sure. Now, now thinking about risk and indeed benefit, um, there's been a lot of talk lately about uh, absolute risk and relative risk. I mean, ba basically, what is the difference between, between the absolute risk and the relative risk? OK, it, probably best to explain this using a sort of a, a, a simple example. If you can, mm. maybe I've got some, if you can share that, uh, that second slide. Yeah, I think, I think we can do that. I think just, be, yeah, is that, is that the yeah, slide okay. you wanted so, there, Norman? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, so absolute and, and relative risk. These are different ways to measure the effectiveness of a treatment, or which, for example, could be a, a vaccine. Um, and also different ways of, of, of also measuring, you know, adverse reactions to a treatment or vaccine. So let's take the example of measuring the effectiveness of a vaccine. If you can just click through. Yeah, so suppose you've got a new vaccine and it's trialled for a known virus which affects 8% of the population. So eight out, of 100, eight out of every 100 people, you know, before the vaccine comes along are going to be infected. Well, suppose this trial takes 100 unvaccinated people and 100 vaccinated people, then obviously you would expect to find about eight cases in the unvaccinated because that's what we know from the, you know, from the population previously. Well, let's suppose that amongst the 100 vaccinated, only you find only two cases. Then what we can say is that the absolute risk of the, getting the virus in an unvaccinated person we know is 8%, that was already there, but now the absolute risk of the virus in, an, in a vaccinated person is only 2%. So if you can just click through again. So, so formally, the absolute risk reduction in getting the vaccine is just the difference between those two, those two risks. So it's the, the absolute risk of infection uh, without, the, without the vaccine minus the absolute 
uh, risk of infection with the vaccine. So it's just eight minus two. And that gives you your six percent. That is that is the absolute risk reduction measure. And, and, and you can also, again, depending on how you're viewing this, you can also think of it of the absolute risk increase of not getting the vaccine. Right. What's the increased risk if we don't get the vaccine? Well, in that case, it's going from it's going from two to eight. So again, it's a 6%. So the absolute risk reduction reduction in getting the vaccine is 6%. And that's the same as the absolute risk increase in not getting the vaccine, right? But the relative risk is a very different measure. So informally, the risk of infection amongst the vaccinated is 25% that of the risk of, effect of infection among the unvaccinated, because two out of eight, that's 25%. So that's how we get this 25% relative, um, relative uh, risk of, of, of infection there. So relatively, that's a 25, that's a 75% risk reduction, right? Because we're going down, we're going, we're taking away the 25%. And that formally, that's how we define the relative risk reduction measure. So the relative risk reduction of getting the vaccine is just one minus the proportion who get the virus divided by the proportion who, sorry, one, so it's one minus the proportion of vaccinated who get the virus, which was the 2%, divided by the proportion of unvaccinated who get the virus, that's 8%. So it's one minus two over eight, that gives you one minus a quarter, which is 0.75, which is 75%. So that's how they formally define the, um, the relative risk reduction. And actually, just click through, that's also formally how efficacy of a vaccine is defined. So formally, they would say the efficacy is 75%. So if you only hear efficacy, they are always talking about the relative risk reduction. OK, now we can also consider the relative risk increase of not getting the vaccine. Now, now, since the rate amongst the unvaccinated is four times that of the vaccinated, because again, it was eight, eight against two, so that's four times, that means not getting the vaccine would increase the risk of the infection by 300%. And formally, it's that, again, that's just the formula of the percentage of unvaccinated who get the virus, now divided by the percentage of vaccinated who get the virus, minus one as a percentage, and that gets you to eight over two minus one, which is three, which is 300%. And that's, again, that's a different way of, there are, whereas the absolute risk increase and the absolute risk reduction are the same, they're not the same when it comes to relative risk increase and reduction. So we've now got, the interesting thing, we've now got four different measures of risk, but there's another one, which in many cases is more intuitive, and that's the number needed to treat. So the number needed to treat, we're asking how many people, how many people do we um, need to treat, in this case with, the va with these vaccine, in order to have one person being stopped from getting infected. And that's defined as simply, do you want to click through this next one? Yeah. Next yeah, one? and that's simply defined as 100 divided by the absolute risk reduction, which is 100 over six, which is 16.7. So we need to treat, you know, 16 or 17 people in order to get one person, not if, you know, to avoid one infection yeah, using this, um, this, this particular vaccine. So, what you can see there is that they're all different. All these measures are different. So you need to know what, you know, if, you, if you're given a, a, if you're told about risk reduction, you need to know which, you know, or risk increase, you need to know which ones they're being, uh, are being spoken about here. They're very different. It sounds a bit like the level of risk can be presented in a way that gives a, a particular impression of, of greater or lesser risk than benefit, depending on the point someone's trying to get across here. Yeah, if you just think about the example, you know, the numbers in that example, mm -hmm. just imagine if all you are told is that the vaccine reduces the risk by X percent, you're given a number. Well, you really need to know if that X is the absolute or the relative risk reduction. If you're told, for example, because you, you could be told that it's a, there's a 75 percent reduction. Well, that's the relative risk reduction. Now, that sounds a lot more impressive than the six percent, which is the absolute risk reduction. And even more so, if you're told there's a 300 percent increase of the virus, if unvaccinated, that was the relative risk increase. 
That sounds a lot more scary than a 6% absolute risk increase of not taking the virus. So, you know, you've got these differences. They're all different. You need to know exactly which one they're talking about. Otherwise, you might have a massively, you know, overestimated uh, perception of what the risk is or underestimated, if, uh, you know, depending on, on, on your perspective. Now, there's also another problem is that there's also a major issue concerning whether the risk measure you're using apply to the whole population or only to people, for example, who have a particular condition. So, for example, let's suppose you've got a drug that's tested on 200 people um, with a particular condition. So, for example, suppose <clears throat> a drug is tested on a 200 people who've got a particular type of cancer. Now, 100 get the drug and 100 get the placebo. Then, suppose we know that the um, it, using the same figures as before, suppose that two out of those um, getting the drug die of cancer within 12 months, compared with eight who die of cancer within of that, of that particular cancer within 12 months who don't get, who, who, who get the placebo. Then because I've used the same figures uh, that I used in that previous example, we know that the absolute risk reduction of dying for those getting the drug is 6%, but the relative risk reduction is 75%, while the relative, in, relative risk increase of not getting the drug is a whopping 300%. Now that sounds really impressive again, if you were, if you were told that. If you were told that the relative risk, you know, the relative risk, inc the relative risk reduction of taking this drug is 75%, that you won't die in 12 months, and that the relative risk increase of not taking the drug is 300%, you know, not dying within 12 months. You'd think this is really, you know, this is a drug, you know, this is... You know, this is this is really important. And so let's suppose that it's a rare cancer, but let's suppose it's a rare cancer affecting only one in a hundred people who have a particular risk factor associated with that cancer. Then you might decide, because you've got these really impressive results, you think, well, let's give this drug to everybody who's got that risk factor. Right? But if it's affecting if 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 only one in 100 people with that risk factor get that cancer, then you can imagine 10,000 people with the risk factor who are given the drug. We know that only 100 are actually going to get the cancer. And of that 100, we know that two will die within 12 months if they get the drug, and six will die within 12 months if they don't get the drug. So basically, what we've got then is that for every 10,000 people with the risk factor... Um, yes, yeah, so, so for people... Given the drug, the absolute risk of dying of the cancer within 12 months is 8 in 10,000. Because we started with 10,000, but only 8 are going to die of cancer if they're not given the drug. Whereas those given the drug, 2 of them are going to die, 2 in 10,000. So we've still got the same relative risk reduction, 75%. But the absolute risk reduction is just 6 in 10,000, which is 0.06%, which... <laughs> You know, which, which isn't a lot at all. And if it turns out that, let's say, 1% of people suffer a serious side effect, then in 10,000 people given the drug, 100 will suffer a serious side effect compared to just six who will benefit from the drug. So you, <laughs> getting, these, getting these numbers, getting the, getting the measures, understanding what, you know, the correct measures and the correct population of people who are, you know, who are given the treatment is really, really important. So that's talking about the benefits of treatment, but could could papers in medical journals also give the impression that an adverse reaction was less common than it might uh, actually be? Yeah, I mean, as the example, I mean, given the example I just it just explained, if you wanted to push a particular novel medical intervention that has a very low absolute risk reduction but has a reasonably high, you know, relative uh, risk reduction, then if it also has, for example, as yet unknown adverse reactions, then you'd certainly want to emphasise risk reduction using the relative risk um, increase rather than, rather, than the ab rather than the absolute uh, risk, sorry, the, the relative risk reduction rather than the absolute risk reduction. You know, you would, that would be the way to do it. So, uh, an, an an ethical medical author in a paper could, uh, in terms of efficacy, be talking about relative risk reduction. 
And in terms of adverse events, could be talking about absolute risk reduction. and Give complete, I mean, we're not saying anyone's done this, of course, but that would give completely the wrong impression if that were to happen. It, I, I can tell you that it has been known for authors to state the benefits of the proposed medical intervention using the relative risk reduction, while if they're forced to, given the risk of adverse reactions using the absolute risk reduction. In other words, the benefits are shown in the most positive light and the risks are shown in the least negative light. And that's going to increase chances that a study is going to be accepted as significant. Oh, that, that's just incredible, isn't it? I mean, it, it, it means that a particular treatment would be uh, taken by most doctors who would probably just read the introduction and conclusion to that article uh, as being efficacious and safe. Yeah. Or maybe we could even use the term safe and effective. When in fact it's not yes, yeah, as you, safe and yeah, effective as, case. As, as it would indicate. If it was presented in that way, that is, that is the conclusion that most people would come to if they don't dig in deep and look at the differences between the different, these different risk measures. Yeah. So is relative risk reduction always going to be higher than absolute risk reduction? In fact, mathematically, you can prove that the relative risk reduction must always be at least as high as the absolute risk reduction, and it can only be equal if you start with 100% of the people being infected, in the case of vaccination, 100% of the people being infected before the vaccination. Because in that case, suppose the vax reduces the infection rate from 100% down to 30%, then the absolute risk reduction is 70%, and the relative risk reduction is also 70% in that case, because it's one minus, uh, um, 3 over 10 as a percentage of 70 percent but the absolute risk reduction can never be less than the relative risk reduction because yeah. even if you if you think about it, if you start with 90 percent and the vax reduce it to 20 percent then we've still got the absolute risk reduction of 70 percent but in that case the relative risk ratio is now 1 minus 2 over 9 times 100, which is 22.2%, which is a bit higher than the absolute risk reduction. So it's always at least as high. Yeah. And normally, many, many times higher yeah. than the absolute risk reduction. Yeah. Or orders of magnitude higher sometimes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Why, why, why can the relative risk reduction vary between populations and vary over time? Well, well, during drug, if you doing trials for a new treatment, the subjects for a start won't necessarily be typical of the whole population to be targeted for that treatment. So, for people with different specific conditions, symptoms, risk factors, etc., even the relative risk ratio will therefore be different once it's rolled out to different, you know, to to to, to, to slightly different populations. So, for example, people with certain lifestyles may be more or less likely to be infected with a virus, irrespective of whether they take the vaccine. And similarly, they may, they may be more or less likely to suffer adverse reactions if they have certain risk factors. Hence, in those cases, the relative risk ratio will vary. However, even if you've got a perfectly homogeneous population taking a new, new drug or vaccine, um, such as a vaccine that, against a particular virus that, let's say, evolves over time, then the relative risk ratio will certainly change as the virus itself evolves. Yeah. And am I right in thinking that the absolute risk reduction, let's say, uh, let's say of a vaccine, if there was a relatively low amount of the virus in the population, um, the absolute risk reduction would be less than if there was more virus circulating in the population at a period of time? Yeah, because that's that's kind of like analogous to the example I gave with the with the fairly rare mm. cancer. It's where because you've got to take account of the um, in that case we we, we um, the, the 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 trial that you use the data on didn't take account of the fact that the the incidence rate in the population was actually very low. So if the if the incident rate in the population decreases over time, then again the 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 absolute risk is also going to be you know, much lower again. I think that's what I found difficult when I was trying to assimilate this, that, that, that the absolute risk reduction is not an intrinsic property of a drug or a vaccine. 
It is the way that a drug no. or a vaccine interacts with a particular population at a particular time under a particular set of circumstances. Exactly. exactly. As, as, the, as the population infection rate changes, mm. if the population infection rate goes down, the absolute, um, absolute risk reduction will also go down. And if the infection rate goes up, then the absolute risk uh, reduction will also go up. Now, I'm, I'm a bit confused. Um, the, 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 the way that risk is reported, the, risk, the benefit of an intervention and the risk of adverse reactions is reported in medical journals. Um, it's, it surprises me that I would have expected the editors of large international prestigious journals to be fully aware of this material. And, and yet particular impressions can get through to being published. Um, really makes me wonder yeah. what, what, what some of the editors are there for, to be quite honest. Um, but without talking about any specifics, um, how could reporting in medical journals of relative risk numbers needed to treat absolute risk, how could that be improved? Well, apart from making clear the very specific features of the population targeted for a medical in intervention, and also ensuring that um, any trial or observational data is based on a super, suitably representative sample of that, what they need to do, what they should be doing, is reporting both the relative... Well, I think the absolute risk reduction is probably the most important, but you should be reporting both. You should be reporting the absolute risk reduction and the relative risk reduction for both the benefits and the adverse reactions. So that's four, that's four um, different measures, right? And... And probably even better, you should definitely also be reporting the number needed to needed to treat, because as I said before, that's that's something that that you know that, that lay people can 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 really understand. Um, uh, yeah, it's much simpler, quite easily, isn't it? Because, yeah. Yeah. because yeah, because for example, if you know that the number needed to treat is a hundred, then we know that for every hundred people given the treatment, one will benefit from it. But if you also know that one in a hundred given the treatment is going to suffer a serious adverse reaction, then we can conclude that for every five people who benefit from the treatment, only one will suffer a serious adverse reaction. And in that case, that case, having those two equivalent you know, numbers to treat and numbers to adverse reaction, in that particular example, that would tell you that, you know, that the benefits outweigh the risk. But of course, if the number of adverse reactions you know, is is higher than the number needed to treat there, then then it then it flips the other way. And of course, as you as you've rightly said, we could be in a situation where a drug looks favourable, but in actual fact, the absolute risk of adverse reactions is greater than any efficacy that could be gained from them. Exactly, and that's why for, you, for, have for, to, for, you have to for, consider both. Yeah, from the preparation. So, any editors of medical journals watching, what I personally like to see in future is absolute risk reduction, relative risk reduction, and numbers needed to treat reported on the efficacy of all new interventions, whatever that intervention is, whether it's a vaccine, whether it's a drug, whether it's whatever, whether it's a physical treatment, anything. I would also like to see, in terms of adverse events, we'd like to see the relative risk and the absolute risk given for adverse events. Is that too much to ask yeah. editors of medical journals? Surely not. Uh, Ab that... abs absolutely not. I mean, yeah, absolutely not. In fact, the fact because that they we should have to ask have, that they, question is they ridiculous. They should have all the data. I mean, the, the problem, the, the one problem is, of course, for new treatments, they won't have, or in many cases, won't have studied the treatment long enough to get good data on the adverse reactions. And of course, that is a, that is a big problem. So a lot of the times they're reporting the relative risk reduction, i.e. where they're simply looking at you know, how well the drug does in treating or stopping whatever it is it's supposed to do and not looking at all at the adverse reactions in any quantitative way. Which brings us on to a completely different matter that we're not going to talk about today, which is post-marketing surveillance, which there's question marks over, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to get into that at the moment. Now, um, I believe you uh, are vaguely familiar with this paper here, um, Norman. This paper is about... Yes. Um, this, this is uh, efficacy and effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccines, absolute versus relative risk reduction. And this is published in the journal Expert Review of Vaccines, and it is peer-reviewed. And the numbers here are quite, quite staggering. So, for example, for the, for the Pfizer vaccine, this is based on the original Phase 3 
trial data, the data from which governments all around the world made the decision to give millions of us this vaccine. The relative risk reduction was 95%. But the absolute risk reduction at the time of the trial was 0.84%. I mean, the emotional impact of those, even as a non-mathematician, of the difference between those two numbers is just, I just find that incredible. And the numbers needed to treat was uh, 119. Um, For the the Moderna, um, the relative risk reduction, 94.1%. The absolute risk reduction, 1.24%. Numbers needed to treat 81. Now, to be fair, in the five or six months after that, the absolute risk reduction from the Pfizer vaccine did go up to, I think it was 3.7%. Um, but it's still one heck of a difference from 95%. I mean, it's a bit of a subjective question, really. But if these numbers had been known about and presented in the way that we have just requested medical journals to present their results in future, yeah. um, do you think that would have made a difference to political decision making? Um. Yes, I, I, I think it. I think it does. I, think I, I, I really do. don't know that there's a big difference between the relative risk and, and, and the absolute risk. Yeah. And uh, you know, and therefore, you know, if they're told ninety five percent, as opposed to zero point eight, no less than one percent, that's the difference between wow and so what. It, it, it really is. I mean, I mean and, I'm, I'm happy to show exactly how. If you want to know how exactly how those figures were computed from, you know, using the um, trial data. I prepared a slide on, on, on that as well. Is that, is that on this, uh, on this, to go through is it on this, is this one? We're it's looking the next at slide. Yeah, we just click. Yeah, yeah, we'll, 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 yeah. We'll, we'll look at that. I've got, I've got you. We'll look at that, please. Yeah. But before we do that, even the, the Oxford AstraZeneca uh, vaccine, um, the relative risk reduction, 72.8, the absolute risk reduction, 1.11. I mean, and uh, the number needed to treat 90. These, these numbers have huge, uh, huge imports. So, so yeah, let, let, let's look well, at the, that. The interesting thing about, yeah, come back to the AstraZeneca in a minute because I've got some. Yeah, let, 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 yeah let's, go, let's go the, on um, and um, Pfizer. let's see if we can see that. So yeah, look at the, the Pfizer trials. Yeah. yeah, that's the one we we're looking at. So um, this should be the next one. Yeah. Yeah, so it's all here. So basically, in this... Those figures that you've given that are in that paper are based on the original, the Pfizer randomized controlled trial. And that had 43,000 individuals who were aged at least uh, 16. And again, they were equally, so about 20, 21,500 were given the vaccine and an equal number given the placebo. And of those who got two doses without any evidence of having a prior infection, and they looked at the results, they observed the results set seven days after the second dose. What the results were and what everything is based on is these, these two figures, that there were eight cases of COVID, eight cases of COVID out of 18,198 in the vaccinated group and 162 cases of COVID in 18,325 in the placebo group. So the entire thing, all of this you know, the, all of the um, emergency use, or, youth or, use authorization was granted on the basis of just 170 cases. That's something to consider for a start. But where do the numbers come? Well, that means that the absolute risk of COVID in the vaccinated is just that uh, eight over that 18,000 odd, which is, you know, 0.0044%. And the absolute risk of COVID in the unvaccinated is 162 divided by that 18,000 or whatever, and that gives you the uh, 0.884%. So the absolute risk reduction is simply the difference between those, which is where you get that 0.84% figure. So that's how that's arrived at, okay? Whereas using the formulas I presented earlier for the relative risk reduction, where you're looking at the percentage of vaccinated who got COVID over the percentage of unvaccinated who got COVID, and that's where you've got the eight divided by 162, that's what gives you, and then one minus that, that's what gives you the 95% efficacy, mm-hmm. i.e. the 95% relative risk reduction. So you've got wow. that there. You can also yeah. look at the relative risk increase, which incidentally, they could, they could have even been more. They could have, 
even more, let's say, deceitful. They could have given the relative risk increase, which is actually almost 2,000 percent. But it still doesn't change the fact that the absolute risk increase is less than 1 percent. And of course, the number needed to treat is just 100 divided by that absolute risk reduction, which was a 0.84 percent. And that's where you get the number 119. And so this that's, math, that's it, how the... Um, yeah, this is not complicated mathematics, Norman, because I'll tell you how I know not, that, because I, I, can, I can follow that. And, and if I can follow it, it's, yeah, not, it's, not, it's not complicated mathematics. That, that really is... Um, it really isn't. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure quite a few people are, uh, are reeling from that. That's, uh, that's, what's, what's on the next one? Do, do we want to talk about this one? Yeah, so, so well, this is in relation to because you mentioned about the that paper was claiming that the that the later studies um, were showing that the uh, relative, that the absolute risk was, go, was 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 increasing quite a lot. It was going up to three point seven percent as high as that, for example, for Pfizer. But there's a problem because there are two issues that massively compromise efficacy measures. Um, especially in the observational studies, which most of those later, most of those later um, numbers were based on. Yeah. Right? Now, the first of these, which again is something which is um, especially pertinent to observational studies, it's actually also pertinent to, to uh, randomised control trial, because there was an issue about this with the, with the, with the Pfizer trial. It's about um, people who actually get COVID or get whatever the, if, you know, the virus is, whatever the vaccine is, people who actually get the disease or the virus shortly after being vaccinated, right? Now, on the one hand, people will argue, well, if you're measuring effect, if you want to measure effectiveness, you've got to allow the vaccine time to become effective, right? Hence, it's normal to consider people who get the vaccine but become infected shortly afterwards, and they normally say up to 14 days, to consider those as unvaccinated, right? Because the vaccine hasn't had a chance. Well, that's all very that's all very well and good, but you have to be very careful in your numbers of how you treat the numbers in that category. Because if, if, for example, you've got an explosion of people getting the virus shortly after vaccination compared with those who, <laughs> who get the placebo, then that's actually telling you something very important about the vaccine, which needs to be... You, you shouldn't be throwing that out and treating those people as unvaccinated, right? But it's even worse because if you go on to the, I've got a little sort of um, little graphic if you go on, which sort of explains the, the impact of doing this. What often happens, I say what happens is of, of treating these people who are infected shortly after vaccination as, as unvaccinated. Let's start with a generic example. Imagine, imagine you've got a non-fatal disease, which in every two week period affects 10% of the people. Okay, click through. Next click. And suppose that people receive a vaccine which is supposed to protect against the disease two weeks after it's taken, but which is actually a placebo. So we're now going to observe some people get the vaccine and some who don't. So go on to the next one. So we've got 100, let's suppose we've got 100 people in the vaccine group and 100 people in the no vaccine group. So click on. So, that, so the, they're... The, the people in the vaccine group and in the no vaccine group, there's going to be 10% infected in weeks 0 to 2, irrespective of which group they are, because the vaccine is just a placebo. It has no effect. OK, so we're going to move. So in weeks 0 to 2, we've got, if you click, you get the 10 people, 10 of the people in the vaccine group, they become infected. And in the no vaccine group, 10 of those come down, they're infected. Now, in weeks, in weeks 2 to 4, the next two weeks, 10% of those previously uninfected, which in, in each case is 9 out of the 90, also become infected. So we're going to get another 9 in the vaccine group become infected and another 9 in the no vaccine group become infected. So what we've got overall is that in each group, 19 out of 100 get infected over the four week period. And if we want to apply that formula for the uh, relative risk reduction, which is next, of course, it becomes it's zero because it's just you just click the formula, it's just, it's just one minus the proportion vaccinated infected over the proportion unvaccinated infected, and it's the same, so it's 0%. But 
But suppose, and that's right, because a placebo should have zero efficacy. But let's suppose that those infected in the first two weeks after vaccination are classified as unvaccinated. Let's see what happens now. Click on. Yeah, so now those, those 10 who are in the vaccine group move over to the no vaccine group. So what we've now got, we're left with nine out of nine who are classified as vaccinated. We've got now nine out of 90 are infected. That's still 10%. But we're now classifying 110 as unvaccinated, of whom 29 are infected, which is 26.4%. And if you apply that efficacy measure, that, that gives you, you're already up to 62% efficacy for this placebo, simply because of this mathematical trick of switching, of classifying the, the, those who are infected in the first week in the vaccine group into the no, into the no vaccine group. They're classified as unvaccinated. Let, and it let, gets let, even let, worse because let actually... Me sure, let me make sure I've got this so far, Norman. You've just demonstrated that yeah. a placebo is efficacious. And you can demonstrate that it's high. You can get easily to 95% accuracy, uh, effort, relative risk uh, reduction efficacy. Because if you, because if you get now, as is the case, when was with mass vaccination, we were observing much higher proportions of vaccinated than unvaccinated. So go on to the next slide. Just imagine now you've got 500 in the vaccine group and only 100 in the no vaccine group. And we do the same argument again. We look at what happens in the first two weeks. 50 out of the 500 are going to be infected in the vaccine group. And we're still going to have 10 in the no vaccine group infected. And then in weeks 0 to 2, again, you're going to get 10% of the previously uninfected, which is 45 out of 450 in the vaccine group. So you're going to get another 45 coming down there. You click on... Yeah, they're going to move down. And again, with a no vaccine group, you're going to get your nine. Now, what happens when we move those infected in the first two weeks who were, va who were vaccinated to the no, to classify them as unvaccinated? They get shifted over there. And what are we left with now? We've got 45. We've got 50. So we've now got 45 out of 450 who are considered vaccinated get infected. That's still your 10%. But of those who are classified as unvaccinated, we've now got how many? We've got, if you go on to click on, yeah, 69, because we've got that, we've got the, um, we've got 60 plus the nine, that's 69 out of 150 classified as unvaccinated, which is 46%, and you're already up to 78% efficacy. And you can easily, in observational studies, and we know this happens, that can push up to easily over 90%, since we know in practice that the, um, the, those people who've been vaccinated are less likely to have to get tested than the unvaccinated. And so fewer of those who are vaccinated who really have the virus are actually recorded as having the virus. And if, for example, only one in three of those who, get the, who, who, who have the virus are tested compared to the um, the, the, those who um, haven't been vaccinated, then you push this up to well over 90%. And it's just, the, it's just a, again, it's a statistical illusion. It's just a trick. So we've now demonstrated that the placebo is the other, the other one, yeah. You heard you it here. Get placebo, you, 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 can easily get you heard it here first. Placebo has 90% efficacy. I don't think you you can even get a dangerous placebo getting up to ninety percent. I one which actually causes if it causes adverse reactions in the first two weeks, because you're classifying those, you're pushing those into the unvaccinated group. You can actually get a dangerous placebo being classified as safe and effective. I mean, to what extent again is this uh, is this reflected? Do you think in, in the way that policy has worked out over the last few years? I mean, that, that's those, of course, I'm using theoretical numbers. Oh, God, this, this is entirely this theoretical. We, we know, we, this is entirely theoretical, but we know in many of these, um, of the, well, even in the, the you know, the, the Pfizer trial itself, you know, how they dealt with the, those who did get um, infections uh, shortly after vaccination. That's, a, that's just, I mean, there's a lot been written about this and the, 
you know, the fundamental flaws, multiple, you know, protocol violations in that in that trial. Um, I mean, in, including the fact that, um, you know, although they were only they were looking at these so-called confirmed cases, which there are only 170, but the study also reports there was a much larger number of suspected but unconfirmed cases. And they were actually quite even, relatively evenly spread between the, the vaccine group and the placebo group. And so it also suggests that a disproportionately small number of the vaccinated participants with symptoms received PCR tests compared to placebo uh, participants with symptoms. Well, that's simple, and they but also, that's they simple excluded, selection bias, isn't they it? Excluded, yeah, they excluded participants who developed COVID before the second dose. So again, they had this problem. I mean, this was a... You know that this was a problem. In fact, um, you know, 100. Uh, in fact, we know, we know that 143 patients were withdrawn because they had COVID before uh, the second dose, and a lot of those were actually at one site, which was another part of the problem. Okay. And, so and, and yeah, these, been, and, and, no... and in, we know in a lot. Sorry. So go ahead, Norman. No, I mean, we know in a lot of the the, the obs in the observational studies this this. Um, this issue of not classifying, you know, not classifying people who get uh, COVID, you know, within that first uh, two weeks vaccination, that that absolutely compromises the results in many of these cases, and and that's why I, I don't really, I, I don't really believe those three percent absolute risk reduction. But there's the second reason. There's the second reason which I want to come on, which I also prepared a little animation for. And that's all to do with having to get a good estimate of the total number of people in the population who actually got the vaccine, I, how many were unvaccinated, what proportion were unvaccinated, mm. and what proportion were vaccinated. And this is massive, the difference, this makes, so if you go, I think it should be the next yep. sort of animation here. If you click through, yeah, that was what we just said about that. Yep. Yeah, so we might not know, yeah, the true proportion, right? So imagine, Imagine we've got a population of 10,000 people and we know that, uh, let's say 100, actually in this case I'm going to talk about dying from a treatment. I won't, it's not, I'm not going to talk about a vaccine, just any treatment. Just no, no, it's 100 people um, die, of this, die of this disease, right? So we've got the 100 people there. Okay, so click through. So we know, if you click through, yeah, so 100 die of some of this virus. So 100 out of 10,000 die of the virus, which is a mortality rate of 100 per 10,000, right? But of course, we want to know the difference between those who the mortality rate in the unvaccinated against the vaccinated. Okay, so we certainly, first of all, we need to know how many of those who die of the virus were vaccinated and how many were unvaccinated. Well, let's suppose that 20, we know that 20 of those who died were unvaccinated and 80 are vaccinated, right? That means 80 are vaccinated, right? Can we from that, do we, can we from this work out the efficacy, the relative, no, because in order to compare the mortality rate of the unvaccinated against the vaccinated, we've also got to know what proportion of the population of a whole is unvaccinated. Well, let's suppose we know the proportion is 10%, that there's 10% who are unvaccinated, so 90% are vaccinated, so click through. So there we've got, that, that would mean that you've got a uh, 1,000 unvaccinated of whom 20 die. So 20 out of 1,000 unvaccinated die of the virus. And we've got, that means that 9,000 are vaccinated of whom 80 die. So if 20 out of 1,000 unvaccinated die of the virus, we know their mortality rate, if you can click through, their mortality rate is therefore 200 per 10K whereas only 80 out of 9,000 vaccinated die of the virus, and that's a much lower mortality rate, that's 89 per 10K. Which, so, so the mortality rate of the unvaccinated in this example is more than twice that of the vaccinated. And that would be really, really strong evidence in favour of the vaccine. That would be very powerful evidence in favour of the vaccine. But what if we got that proportion, that estimate of the number unvaccinated wrong? Let's suppose instead of 10%, the true number was 30%. Let's just run, run through that and see how, how that makes a difference. So in this case, 
you're going to have 3,000 unvaccinated and 7,000 vaccinated. That means 20 out of 3,000 unvaccinated die of the virus. And that means their mortality rate is, just click through, 20 out of 3,000. Yeah, their mortality rate is then 67 per 10K, whereas 80 out of the 7,000 vaccinated die of the virus, and that's a higher mortality rate, that's now 114 per 10K. So in this case, the mortality rate of the vaccinated is, more, is almost twice that of the unvaccinated, and that would be very powerful evidence against the, the, the vaccine. So just changing that, getting that, that proportion right, and why... You know, and why is this so important? Because actually, we know that in the UK, that we now know also in the US, studies, which of course, especially these empirical observational studies, which rely heavily on getting a good estimate of the proportion who have been unvaccinated, we know that the estimates massively differ from different sources. So for example, in May 2000, in May of this year, the Office for National Statistics reported that eight, there was only 8% of adults were unvaccinated. But the U UK Health Security Agency were saying at that time around about 20% of adults were still unvaccinated. And an ICM poll that was conducted for, um, which was actually used in the BBC documentary called uh, Unvaccinated, and that was a very, very a large and, and very representative poll of UK adults. That found 26% were unvaccinated. So you've got this difference. Is it 8%? Is it 26%? Well, like that, that theoretical example I just showed you shows you how much of a difference it makes in getting that proportion right. Everything can change. And that's why, you know, I, I'm very sceptical of studies which haven't got very accurate you know, assessments of what these underlying proportions are. People talk about getting the correct denominators. That's what they mean when you hear people talk about that. And these percentages actually transpose through into potentially tens of thousands of lives. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. Um, have we got any more slides to look at, Norman? Was that the last one we wanted to? Um... No, I think that, that covers that covers everything. Covers I that, yeah. So um, I was hoping to. No, that, that, that's great. And what, 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 I, what I find a bit, uh, a bit confusing as well is the Office for National Statistics um, don't seem to, I mean, I mean what, they seem to be falling into some of these basic errors that you've been describing. The problem with the Office for National Statistics is that they rely on data given, them, given to them from various other sources within the NHS, within the National Immunisation System, so, and also from GPs. There are, lots of, there are lots of points in that process at which errors can be introduced, right? So the ONS, for example, although, although it, is, it is always the case that, that if you're looking at just um, COVID infections, and the efficacy of, of the vaccines, they're using this two week rule and therefore you get that, you get that classification of people who got the, got the vaccine, who get infected and they considered to be unvaccinated. With deaths, the ONS are adamant that if somebody does die, even if it's, even if it's in a day, you know, whatever, it, it doesn't have to, you know, they don't wait the two weeks. If someone dies after a vaccine, they are classified as a vaccinated death. That's what the ONS tell us. But the problem is, Problem is, they're not the ones who get, again, who've got, who are the source of that information. They're getting it from other sources, and the sources they're getting them from don't necessarily record. You know, if someone dies shortly after getting uh, a vaccination, right, or the, the next day, you know, the last thing people, they're, they're worried about, this is a real person who's died, the last thing they're going to be worried about is recording, oh, did this person get vaccinated? Recently? You know, that's not, it might, that's the sort of thing that gets, that gets missing. And we actually know because we looked at the data in detail and we actually know by simply analyzing the the weekly plots of the ons data on on mortality that we know that there was a misclassification we know that people um the only explanation for certain peaks that we were seeing in the unvaccinated shortly after the vaccine rollouts peaked we know that those peaks can only be explained by um people uh who recently got the vaccine within two weeks being classified as unvaccinated who died, right? Because they're dying of non... We've got this peak in non-COVID deaths of people shortly after 
the VAX rollout, right? And so that can only really be explained by this, this, this misclassification. So, you know, we know that happens. The other problem is the ONS, their vaccine surveillance uh, reports rely on a very, very special and, and, and really biased subset of the England population, right? It's not the whole population. It's, it's 39 million people, right? Not the 55 million population of England. Namely, that it, it, to, be in that, to be in their data set, you had to have been uh, around at the time of the 2011 census. That's why it's only people over at least 10 or 11. And you also have to have been registered with a GP in England in 2019. So you've got to satisfy those both criteria. So 39 million people satisfy that criteria, but it means we know that at least 8 million adults are missing. And those 8 million who are missing are not at all representative of the population who are in there, because these are, you know, these are likely to be, you know, again, a younger profile, um, people, you know, who, let's say, are less, who, who, uh, you know, don't want to, let's say, you know, they, they don't believe in, you know, they don't, they don't feel the need to register with a GP. They might be, you know, healthy. There's a lot of immigrants in there. New immigrants are all, all in there, etc. And of course, that massively buys the numbers. So, in theory, I mean, in theory, it really could be the case that that there are only eight percent of the adults in the ONS data who are unvaccinated, whereas in the whole of the population, it could be as high as you know, twenty, twenty-six percent. And that's, I think, when we did the last. Um, uh, video together that was saying they investigated. So that would mean a massive proportion of those who are not in the ONS database would, would have to be unvaccinated. And again, it seems like a fairly basic um, s s sample selection error. And and for the ONS to take one measure of, uh, one statistic for efficacy and a different statistic for deaths seems a bit surprising, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we're not we're not particularly happy with, um, you know, in fact, we were, you know, we call, we actually called for for the withdrawal of any um, anybody who'd made sort of definitive conclusions about vaccine safety and efficacy on the basis of those uh, that ON that those ONS vaccine mortality surveillance reports. We called for those to be withdrawn because we believe the data was so unreliable. And of course, you and I are paying and so, so confounded. It, 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 this is taxpayer funded, isn't it? We would expect it to be. It is, yeah. To, to be to be pretty accurate. I mean, to yeah. be fair, that you know, the people have been, you know, they've they've always been, you know, good at answering our questions. They provided some, you know, within limits. They provided some additional information that we'd asked for. You know, some additional sort of more fine grained um, data. But you know, we 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 never got access to the full source uh, data to really get into uh, you know all of these issues. You know, to be able to resolve them. I mean, to me, this just shows the massive importance of people like you peer reviewing uh, government groups. And it disappoints me that you don't have access to the full source data that they have. So the independent academics and statisticians such as yourself again, can run the same they claim test. That it's the, that, um, they claim that, of course, they can't release it because they claim that if you're giving, if you're giving high, fine, finely grained um, uh, mortality data, then that can easily be de-anonymized and therefore you, you would find out, you know, that that could be located, you know, that could be isolated to particular individuals and, you know, nobody wants that to happen, but um, that's, that's, that's the reason why they're not able to do it. Um, no, but you work within an ethical framework, that. you're aware of that risk and you, would, you wouldn't do yeah, that. Yes, of course, we wouldn't do it, we would just make the conclusions, but that's why they, they can't, they won't, you know, that's why they wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to release that data. Yeah, well, that's why they say they can't release the data. Indeed, indeed. Well, Norman, thank you so much for that. I'm, 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 I'm my mind's still reeling of the the fact that uh, placebos can have such high efficacy. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's just uh, just such a ludicrous concept. Um, so um, you know, people say lies die and lies in statistics, but it's not. It's not what we need is not disuse of statistics it is correct use of statistics and uh yes people like yeah. me depend on people like you to uh, to, to do that so it does uh, not, the, the thing is i mean we start look the thing is we started the 
conversation talking about sort of Bayesian probability, which people, um, you know, don't expect people to understand that's a bit sophisticated. You don't rely, you don't require any sophisticated no. statistics like that or probability analysis like that for this type of analysis. You really don't. It really is, you know, it's, you know, it's not even a level of statistics 101. It's just simple common sense maths, simple. Mm. That's it. And again, two main lessons. People like you need access to core data from drug trials, for example. To, to run an independent peer review and analysis of that. And we yeah. need full reporting in, not simplistic, but simplified terms in every medical publication. I mean, I'm just talking about the field of medicine here. I mean, in, in every field really, but it, it certainly in, in talking about drugs and vaccines and all those sort of things, we need, we, need, we need this relative risk. We need the absolute risk and we need the numbers needed to treat. And for the results, for the side effects, we need the relative risk and the absolute risk. It's not too much to ask. And yet we don't get yeah. it. We don't get our extra yep. bowl of yep. porridge that we would, we, would, we would like. We don't, yeah. Norman, thank you for all your work and, and for this PowerPoint. I know this is not- Can I just a... make one little Please part? Please do. My, me and my colleague, Martin Neal, have, um, we started a sub stack, which is called uh, Where oh, Are yeah. Numbers? Yeah, yeah. Oh, fantastic. Sub -stack, yeah, yeah. Love sub stacks. Oh. Um, so, um, yeah, if you can send us the link to that, we'll put that on. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll also be posting links to, uh, to Norman's YouTube channel and to this video, this very same video on Norman's channel, so we can uh, ho hopefully uh, cross fertilize between our channels because I need all the statistical yeah. help I can get, and Norman's provided that. So, thank you very much, Norman, and, and great to talk to you as always. Excellent. Okay, thanks a lot, John. Thank you.